DIY was like blowing up everywhere. I mean, it wasn't just beauty. Obviously makeup has always been DIY, but hair color at home or self tanner, but also you go out to other consumer categories like food or even to media, Netflix, et cetera. All of these things were making it possible for people to replicate these out of home exciting experiences in their home and people were enjoying it. And so when nails wasn't part of that conversation, it almost was screaming to me, we should do this. We built the brand and now how do we bring this to everyone? Explore the minds and marketing strategies behind today's winning brands and businesses. Tap into the power of the creator economy with Earned by Creator IQ. Here's Connor Begley. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Earned. Today, I've got Sarah, the founder and CEO of Olive and June on the show. Welcome, Sarah. Thank you. Happy to be here. I had so much fun putting together the kind of questions for you on this one, because I think one, you're such a fascinating person. Obviously, the brand is killing it right now. And you're just really open, which I love. So I think this should be a good time. Well, let's start at the top. So I think that right now your brand's on fire, right? It's starting to get a lot of industry attention. You're the fastest growing brand in the nail category. But you started this journey over a decade ago with a single salon. And now you're winning like major beauty product awards with the CEW. And I think what's really interesting about this journey that you've gone through is in a lot of ways, it mirrors a company that I think inspired your journey in Drybar. Was their journey the inspiration for you in creating these products and building this business? And I think more broadly, just tell us the journey a little bit. Absolutely. So I love Drybar. I love Allie. She's one of my closest friends. I was very honored to have her be in my corner for forever, really, but definitely in the beginning of Olive in June. And we started as a salon business. So it was really originally created, definitely inspired by Dry Bar. As we grew, it changed. I think what's exciting about what Allie did is that it was like a, such a pioneer in the space. And I think we did something similar, but we took a left turn there where instead of doing a salon chain, we had three salons when we launched products. What we realized was that our clients are walking out of our salons feeling incredible about themselves. They feel joy. They feel ready to take on the world. Their nails are done. They feel good about themselves. And we weren't able really to satisfy the demand in three salons, but also across the country. So I thought to myself at one point, I can't grow this thing fast enough. But also, not everyone can afford a $25, $30 manicure every week. Not everybody wants to sit in a salon. And so once I saw how people felt and I realized I am just like tapping on the door of potential of what this brand can do and also being so inspired to give people an affordable, accessible salon quality manicure or pedicure, but at whatever price and time they wanted to spend, it made sense to me to really think about the DIY journey and think about what can we actually do to replicate this experience and the end product and give it to everyone everywhere. The other thing was DIY was like blowing up everywhere. I mean, it wasn't just beauty. Obviously, makeup has always been DIY, but hair color at home or self-tanner, but also you go out to other consumer categories like food or even to media, Netflix, et cetera. All of these things were making it possible for people to replicate these out of home, exciting experiences in their home and people were enjoying it. And so when nails wasn't part of that conversation, it almost was screaming to me, we should do this. We've built the brand and now how do we bring this to everyone? So Drybar was the original inspiration, but we really forged a new path, which I'm truly so grateful that we saw the vision for. It seems like that timing was good as well, because this was like 2019. You had the pandemic six to 12 months out that obviously had a huge impact on service businesses. It feels like that timing was fortunate. That worked out so well. I know if we hadn't had the foresight to have a product business to really be excited about the DIY piece of the business, we wouldn't be in business anymore. The pandemic would have wiped out the salons. So this brand lives on. It's in a different way than it started, but we are giving so many more people the ability to have an Olive and June mani-pedi than we ever could have before. So 
while it was an incredibly hard time for so many reasons, that was the big bright spot of joy is that we had somehow had the foresight to have a dual side of business. Well, I'm curious, as you look at the last four years of the business and being the fastest growing brand in the category, do you think there were particular turning points, maybe outside of the pandemic, that played a big role in getting you to this point? And then maybe what have been the learnings for you getting into being a product business versus a service business? Everything. It's just funny because you look back and you're like, thank God I made a bunch of the right decisions because it led us here. We weren't trying to pivot. We were expanding a current business that actually had been a bigger business in year one by almost 100% than I ever expected. It was on fire immediately. And it was clear that we were solving a pain point for the consumer. But we launched with innovation and we came out of the gates very strong saying the Poppy, which is our patented polished bottle handle and the Manny system, this is the new way to do your nails. And because everything was innovative, whether it be things you had never seen before, like the Poppy or bringing back different components or a polish formula that lasted longer than other polishes on the market, we launched in the right way. We were able to be very clear about who we were from the beginning and always being solution-based, always thinking about our pain points for our consumer. And then obviously we added education and content on top of that. And I think ultimately very few nail brands, if at all, were doing that. And we knew that that was going to go hand in hand with the innovation and product. But then we grew the right way in retail and we were super thoughtful. We went exclusively into Target, which was already a destination for nails. We didn't go into a beauty retailer like we just were thoughtful about where the consumers were already shopping. And then we stayed at Target exclusive for four years, which is two years longer than anybody else normally stays. We launched innovation there. They supported us. We grew it together and it really worked. And so I think we were really thoughtful about distribution. And then we continue to innovate on the product side. And then we follow the consumer. We expand to Walmart and Walgreens, but we did it in a very specific way. And if you walk into those stores, while they all have like live in the same product world, they're slightly different because the consumers are different and they shop differently in different retailers. So I think it's just a lot of focus on the consumer, like on the customer, on who is receiving these products and how are they using them and how do they want to be spoken to and treated. And we try to hold them in the highest regard and give them as much as we possibly can. Yeah. I think that as I listen in that customer centricity or like really thinking about the customer journey thinking about innovation and like how you're innovating on behalf of them obviously stands out to me. And then one of the other ones that I always really liked is a co-founder of Tula and the co-founder of Bobby Brown. This is Ken Landis and Tula sold for a ton of money. Obviously, Bobby Brown sold for a ton of money and he wouldn't leave a distribution channel, like you said, in Target until he was the number one in that category in that distributor. Because he knew that if he was the number one, they'd give extra love, extra attention, et cetera. And so he had a real focused and deep strategy, right, when it came to distribution. And so love that you did that. And I think it's a really smart way to approach it based on what I've observed. We knew that the longer we built it at Target, the bigger we were going to get. Like we had the right product at the right price. Like it's the right market. Mass is us. We are mass. And so we were super thoughtful then about how we layered it every single year. And to his point, are the fastest growing brand in that retailer, are the number one performing brand in that retailer. But the other thing is that actually going into other retailers, we have performed even better at Target. The consumer likes to be able to shop you in different places. And if they're near Walgreens, they want to pop in and get a set of press-ons or some polish and vice versa, Target, Walmart. So that's been super helpful for us. There is such a ecosystem in nail that we've learned and that we've been really excited about. But I agree with him. Being thoughtful on distribution is so critical and you're serving the consumer right, which again is what the focus should be. I'd love to take a step back in your life and in your career back to the age of 30, right? So that year you left a 10-year finance career. You switched coasts from East Coast to West Coast. You went through a separation with your spouse. And I know that your brother was a big supporter of you during that time. But still, I have to imagine that was like 
a crazy year. That had to be really stressful. Can you tell people a little bit about that journey? Take us back to that kind of experience in your life in that time. When I think back on it and when I think about the through line to all of the hard experiences in my life, I come back to, I am such a firm believer that you get to live life once. While I take a lot of thought and consideration in making my decisions, I'm not just like willy nilly, okay, this relationship isn't working for me. After 10 months of marriage, I'm going to get a divorce. I was never like that. But if things are not working, I dig deep. This is like a through line for me. I dig deep and I make a change. When you know something's not forever, you just don't have that much time on this planet. I learned from my dad, who moved us around a lot in my life, to fight for the experience that works. Like, keep looking. My life now is amazing. I get to run this incredible company. My most favorite human in the world is my daughter. And every day she makes me smile and laugh. I think one of the things that brings to mind for me is this idea of like having to make choices that are hard, but also realizing that you can't have everything. Like you have to be intentional with the choices you make and it's okay to choose one thing and not choose something else. Like I think in particular, women are faced with this challenge even more so with men. There's this really great article. I can't remember her name, but basically it was a dean of this university and she's like, women are expected to be the stay-at-home mom and the partner at the law firm and all the PTA meetings and in perfect shape and all these different things. And the reality is if you want to be the partner at the law firm, you don't necessarily get to go to every soccer practice, right? And that was honestly, for me, a very pivotal moment because when we started the company, I felt pulled in a bunch of different directions. And I said, okay, I have to choose, right? Like, okay, I'm going to choose my family and I'm going to choose work and I'm going to choose a little bit of health, but that's going to sacrifice my friends. And that's okay. It's okay to make that choice. And so it's tough to do to make those kinds of choices. But I think it's great that you can serve as an inspiration to others that are facing like a similar dilemma, right? Or a similar kind of crisis. They're not feeling like they're in the right spot right now. It's so hard, but don't settle. That's what I say constantly to people because people come to me all the time for advice because I feel like I've done enough things wrong. <laughs> so if you can just not settle, you'll live the life you want to live and you'll be so happy and it's so worth it. But it's hard, but you have to be willing to go through the hard. I mean, the same thing with all of in June. I went through so much hard work and now the company is thriving and I feel so grateful. But you work 24 seven and all the things. I hear you on the, you have to be the PTA mom and the best wife and the best mom and just end shape and the hot date and all these things. But you just have to try to be the best version of yourself making the choices you wanna make. I think it's tough for everybody feeling like you want to do everything and not being able to, right? I think it's also you have to prioritize. And I was never good at doing that. But I've, in the last few years, gotten really good at it because only a few things matter. That's the reality. And if you're focused on things that don't matter, like you have a friend that's sucking all your attention or you're in the wrong relationship or you're in the wrong job, like once you make these changes, your life changes like in such a fantastic way. But it's hard. So you guys also are surging with influencers too particularly over the last six months. I mean, I think you're up close to 60% year over year while your next closest competitor is up like 1%. What's going on there? Like, what are you guys doing in the influencer space? What's working? Why is it growing? How are you guys approaching it? Everyone at Olive in June, everyone in every role is obsessed with solving consumer pain points. When we first started, we didn't have any money for sponsored posts. So it wasn't really even something I thought about, but it was really about when do I buy something that someone recommends? Do I buy it because there's a sponsor post? Sometimes because they say I love this product forever. Now the company's hired me. But most of the time, I only want to do it when it's unsponsored. So we were super thoughtful about the consumer, especially the beauty consumer, wants real recommendations. And so we were gifting our product from the beginning. Every product we create has innovation tied to it and it is more effective in the market. So we will not relaunch a product unless it is better and it fills a real need. Let's get the product into people's hands and then let it do its thing. I pray when I say this that you will remember this, but there'll be a lot of people that will not, but there was a movie called Field of Dreams and Kevin Costner says, if you build it, they will come. 
And I believe so firmly in that. It's like launch a product that's really, really good, that's better than anything in the market, that's actually transformational. And people, once they get it, they will post about it. They will care about it. They will be into it. And so that's our approach. So Hana and her team, she'll think about what does this person want? Do they want a fast mani? So I'm sending them quick dry. I'm sending them press-ons with tabs, with sticky tabs. Do they want a two to three week mani and they want long nails, they want them to look like gel X? I'm sending them our glue press-ons and so on and so forth. So she's really thoughtful and the team's really thoughtful about, I'm not gonna engage someone in the community without thinking about what am I doing for them? Because I don't need to just send products out in the world. And that's just always been the philosophy. Yeah, but I do think leading with the products and leading with authenticity and trust in terms of the content is so consistent with what we see be successful, number one. And I think number two, on this idea of like leading with innovation, leading with solving problems, leading with actually having a stellar product, the best way I've ever heard that described was by a guy named Ian Rogers. So he was the CDO, Chief Digital Officer at LVMH globally, reported directly to Bernard Arnault. Prior to that, he was the CTO at Beats when they sold for a billion dollars. And he said, he called it the hyper-efficiency of quality. He's like, what the internet has enabled is for people to find brands that are amazing, that maybe don't have the kind of marketing budgets of a Revlon, that don't have these massive marketing campaigns. So today, the better your product is, the more quickly it will grow versus historical averages. And if your product isn't very good, people also figure that out really quickly. And so whether that's through influencers or reviews on Sephora.com or whatever, creating a really stellar product, I think is 100% at the core of like winning in this market outside of all the social media stuff. I could not agree more. We do not launch a product until it's ready. I can't stand a Manny that ships or that pops off. And so we just launched press-ons with tabs. So we had press-ons with glue. In six months, we were the number two brand in artificial in the market. It was because the product was so good. It was size inclusive and four or five shapes and lengths. Like there's so many things. It's the realest looking fake nails you'll ever find. But then people wanted ones without glue. And we just launched with the tabs and they almost last too long. There's nothing that makes me feel better than when products work. So we have the highest level of quality on that. And like I said before, a non-transactional relationship, a meaningful, deep connection with either a consumer or an influencer, anybody in our world is so critical to people caring and wanting to use your products over and over again. Yeah. And honestly, it's bad, like you said, for like getting repeat purchases. I was in Paris with senior leadership at LVMH. And if you look at what's happened with Tiffany's over the last couple of years since they acquired it, they've doubled profits, basically doubled revenue. In terms of influencers, they're now our number one watches and jewelry brand. And the thing that they really invested in or tried to invest in really aggressively was like, how do we make Tiffany's like a forever brand? How do we make it something that you collect and you keep? So they invested in repairs. They invested in like, how do we extend the life cycle of these products? And I think in the short term, yes, people will buy less stuff because it doesn't break as often. But I think in the long term, it's just absolutely the right strategy. Actually, while we're on that journey of kindred spirits, you know, I started publishing 11 months ago, and it's been crazy in terms of the impact it's had. And I think I've learned a lot as part of that process. You also publish, right? You've got 30,000 fans on Instagram. I'm curious, what has that journey been like for you? What made you decide to start publishing yourself and putting yourself out there? I am not a person who thinks about what I'm going to publish or post. Obviously, with Olive and June, that is a brand account. We have a calendar. We think about it. Everything is structured and scheduled. And Dee, who runs our social, who's just so amazing and cracks me up every day, will obviously interject things that are culturally relevant. And I always say to her, what do you want me to post? And she's like, you do you. She really likes that I'm a bit off the cuff and I just post how I'm feeling at that moment. And so I don't think about it other than I try to share as much as I can of what people ask for because I understand that the founder journey is interesting and being a mother is interesting. And But sometimes I don't share things that I'm not ready to share and I don't feel compelled to. I try to do it as best I can and be myself. Like Eva Chen is one of my favorite follows. 
because she's herself. There's either 8 million Instagram posts or like one, you know, she's just who she is. And it's kids and it's fashion and it's all these things and I just love her. So I try to just be myself as best I can. And I think that works. I think probably I should share more. Yeah, I definitely struggle with this idea of like, how vulnerable do you want to be? How much do you want to be out there? Because I think that in reality, the more vulnerable you are and the more that you put out there, I do think it ends up juicing the numbers, so to speak. You're going to be a bigger account. You're going to have more people paying attention to you because there's interest in vulnerability, there's interest in challenges, interest in the hard things. But I don't feel comfortable doing that personally. Like I don't feel comfortable putting everything out there. It's definitely something that I haven't perfectly figured out yet myself either. Everyone has to do what they feel comfortable with. Social is a crazy thing, right? Like it's sometimes the best thing and sometimes the most toxic place. And so really being protective of your boundaries. And I think the prioritization we were talking about earlier, like having boundaries around it. And I have people ask me personal questions all the time. And sometimes I just started ignoring it. If I don't want to answer it, if I'm not ready, like when I'm ready, I'll talk about it. And now as my child's almost nine, the question becomes, how much do you post your child? How much do you let in? Like, I started to close friends on Instagram because the reality is she probably won't want me to be posting about her all the time. She's going to have her own opinions about it when she has her own social in five, hopefully never years. But I think boundaries are good. Like Olivia, for example, my team who runs our content has been very vocal with me about having boundaries. She's been so supportive and it's been the right move for me personally. But it's hard. I mean, like decisions are hard. Yeah, we had the professor at UCLA. She literally teaches a class on like, how to be an influencer. I had her on the podcast. It's crazy. She has people that'll come into her class that have hundreds of thousands of followers. But she said the uniform thing, no matter whether they have a big audience or not, they all assume that just having this digital life that's visible to others is just a fabric of themselves. It's just a big part of their identity. And it's like so weird, I think for our generation and obviously the generations beyond us, that's not been a big part of my life, despite the fact that I'm in this industry. And so it's really interesting starting to think about that next generation and how that's not even like a question. That's just day-to-day -day life. And that's just how it is. Obviously, I'd imagine your daughter, like you said, is you're starting to think about that for her a little bit and where she's headed to. I'm starting to think about how I can control her to never be on social. <laughs> it's daunting. It's complicated. It's layered. And social built all of in June. And that's how we, in the pandemic, went live for seven weeks in a row and taught everyone how to paint their own nails. I mean, we were the bright spot for people. And so I don't want to take it away, but then how do you attempt to control it, which you really have no control. So it's complicated. Yeah, totally. I think you're right in the middle of this entrepreneurial journey. And I think that there's a lot of other people that are going to think about what if I wanted to start my own brand and I'd be curious for you, if you had advice for others that are considering careers as entrepreneurs, as you reflect on the last 10 years or so, what would be your advice to them? What do you think they need to know? I think your point before about you can't have it all and sometimes your friends take the back seat or things that are just not the number one priority at that moment are going to take a back seat is really insightful and that gets the heart of the matter. I used to tell everyone, just do it. And I am so much more measured now because I have a rational exuberance, but it is incredibly difficult. I mean, I've been at this for over 10 years and everyone thinks that this has always been easy and it's always been big and it's always been a target and Walmart and Walgreens. And it hasn't. Be thoughtful about the life that you want and what you want to create. I think I was born to try and hopefully I do make this, but I was born to want to make an impact on the world and make people feel good about themselves. So I'm so happy that I took the leap, but I don't think I had any idea how little life I would have had for the first six, seven years. As my daughter said to me last night at dinner, she was hearing me talk about something. She said, mommy, I'm so glad you don't have salons anymore. And I looked at her, I said, what? She said, I wanna go into them. The only manicure she's ever gotten done for, it was at Olive in June. And she said, but I didn't see you very much. She remembers those first four years, I wasn't around very much. And so 
you think about how different your life can be based on the choices you make. And you just have to be ready and willing to make the sacrifice. And it's a lot more than people, I think, anticipate. Just the way that you describe it is almost exactly the same experience that I had. It's slightly different. Like I started, I was like, everybody's got to do it. Everybody needs to be an entrepreneur. And now I'm like 12 years into it. It's a big choice. It's more of a choice than you realize. And then I think one of the kind of my own version of the salon story is we had my son and he was about one and a half at the time. And then we have my daughter in March of 2020. And so obviously the pandemic happens and everything shuts down. And we were like an in-office company and we went from in-office to remote and I was traveling all the time. And then I stopped traveling because there's no travel at that point. And it had such an impact on my connection with my kids during that time. Because again, instead of getting like a half hour in the morning and a half hour at night, you know, I'm getting three or four hours with them because I'm not commuting anymore. And you don't think about that, but it adds up, right? Like getting three or four hours more a day, five days a week, 200 days a year is like a huge impact on your relationship. And I would remember when I would travel, and unfortunately, I've gotten back to travel a little bit, it'd take them like a day or two to feel close again. And so in a lot of ways, for me, all the terrible things about the pandemic were it really changed my relationship with my kids. And so I think prioritizing that is important. And knowing that if you do sign up to be an entrepreneur, it's not like an eight to five or nine to five, right? Like it's on your mind all day. Let's talk a little bit about investors for a second. So we've got these people, we've now all discouraged them from starting a business. So that's great. But if they did, want, <laughs> if we did want them to start a business, investors are a really big part of that. And I know that you brought on a really cool kind of list of investors, some really big names out there. One of the other investors that we actually share in common with Brian Sugar, and I asked him about you, he said you were one of his favorite brand founders, period. So I asked him what question I should ask you. And he said, ask her which investor was the quickest to understand her, what she was doing and to commit. I have to imagine knowing Brian that he is going to be the answer, but you tell me if it's not, if it's somebody else. I will say he was the investor. I'm so scared to meet him. He and his wife, for anyone who doesn't know, started Pop Sugar. And obviously Pop Sugar is such a massive impact on media. But he immediately said to me after, the minute you started talking, I thought to myself, please have a good product so that I can invest in this person because he got me. Like he understood me from minute three. The thing is like the best investors are the ones that offer way more than cash and that capital is not their only value. And Brian obviously is that investor in spades and understands like he can tell me what's happening currently in media, currently in the consumer world, currently in investing, because that's what he's doing all day, every day. And so I really push myself to have investors that have an expertise in consumer and are working now because it really has a massive impact. Well, the other good thing about Brian and investors generally, for anyone who is starting a company who didn't get discouraged by us, is have an investor like Brian who when you tell them you don't agree with them, they're like, okay, go for it. He doesn't fight you when you say, I'm not going to do it that way. And then he always says when he was wrong. So he's got so much humility and he's so supportive. Yeah. The uh, disagree but commit, I think, is a really powerful concept. Bezos obviously has gotten really well known for it, but like not how I would do it, but like go for it. I'm in. You're the one making the calls. So one last thing I want to hit before we do like one kind of fun end of show question. Have you ever considered taking a more active role in the kind of investing side for female founded businesses or thought about getting more involved? Absolutely. I mean, I talk about this a fair amount on social and it's so depressing that women and especially women of color get such low numbers on investment. And I think 2%, 3%, it fluctuates. Sometimes it's 1.7, which is even more depressing. But this has been proven by research. I don't mean it to be stereotypical, but like women are often less comfortable asking for money, talking about money, and frankly, talking about their success. I have talked about this with friends. I don't know if I've ever talked about it on a podcast, but I feel when I talk about how well Olive and Jude is doing, I think I'm bragging. And I don't think men think that very often. They 
are excited by the concreteness of their success. And as a woman, societally, like, I feel guilty and like I'm bragging. So I think women have a harder time promoting their business and it shows in the pitches. And so that has to be dismantled. We have to get to a place like women solving women's problems. And I'm not saying that the nail customer pain point is all women, but it's predominantly women that are in the category. And me solving that problem makes sense. So why do we have men mostly running a lot of these beauty companies and solving problems that aren't their own? And it goes obviously well beyond beauty and fashion into lots of categories. But I have an incredible network of female founder friends, and we all want to help the female entrepreneurs coming after us because before Olive and June competes with household names, they're either companies have been sold and run by men now or owned by men in the nail category. And so me and other of the founders that are coming up in our category need to be supported because the whole point is our products are better and we care about our customer and we are our customer. So I feel very passionate about it and I'm very hopeful that I can do what women did for me and I can do that for others and that we can change that because there's just such a bias. It's really pathetic, honestly. What's funny is as I think about it, you think about all the brands now that have either recently been acquired or that are blowing up, whether it's Glow Recipe or Summer Fridays or Drunk Elephant or You Guys or Huda Beauty or Anastasia's brand or any of these others. It's cool that in some ways, I think the internet has allowed women to start brands without really having to go through a gatekeeper, without having to necessarily get financing immediately. And like how many of the up and coming indie brands in the beauty category specifically are founded and run by women primarily. It's actually really cool. I hadn't really thought about it from a numbers perspective that way recently. And to me, the best ones, and Glow is a great example of this, we're a great example of this, the founders and CEOs run the businesses still. I don't have any investors, and neither does Glow, that tells us what to do. We are supported by investors who say, like Brian, but also my lead investor in the very beginning, who's still on my board, right? He supports me. He says, you know this best. I invested in you. So he'll give me advice. He'll give me thoughts. He'll give me suggestions. But like, ultimately, it's my call. And I would like to see so much more of that from men and women. So from all investors of saying like, I picked my horse in the race and I'm going to support them and let them run. I think the products show when that's the case. So one fun to end the show question. So you've mentioned in another interview, like as the founder, you're still taking out the garbage sometimes. I can tell you what my garbage is. My garbage is expense reports. I want to stab myself in the eye every single month that I have to do an expense report. I can't stand anything more in life. I don't know why. It just it boils my blood. What are the taking out the garbage things you still can't? quite get rid of them, but you still have to do them as a business. I delegated and slunk my way out of a number of things because in the beginning, everyone's like, you're the finance person. And I was like, no, not for me. So I really hire people that are very skilled at what they do. And I made the mistake in the beginning of not doing that and being a micromanagey person which nobody wants, and I don't want to be. And so I've learned how to grow out of that and learned how to grow and getting my hands in everything. But I will say, I had a COO, CFO, her name is Claire, and she worked predominantly with the salons. And she taught me something and she left, but she's still one of my closest friends and I love her. As you can see, I keep my circle very tight. And she said to me, You should think of yourself, you should think about the hours that you spend on something and you should assign a value to that. $100 an hour, let's say. $20 an hour, whatever it is. If you could delegate it just as well for less, do it every single time. So that stuck with me. And then I started to hire people that were very skilled at their jobs. And then it's not about the money. It's about, oh, they do it better than me. So why am I in the world getting in the way? And so if you... Have that mindset that you're not good at everything. We don't have to do everything. And the whole point is there are people that are better at me than doing pretty much almost everything. So um, 
but yeah, I still, I'm still creating posts. I'm still creating content. I'm still, you know, for the brand, I'm still doing all the time. I don't like being in front of the camera as much as I like being on Instagram. I don't like doing any of the videos. Like I start to stress out, but you got to do it. You got to grow the business. So whatever it takes, I'll do. Sarah, I really appreciate you taking the time. I'm so glad we got to spend the time together. I know I learned a lot. I'm sure others are going to learn a lot too. And congrats again on all the success as a business and not surprising based on kind of the way that you guys have built things and the approach that you've taken, but still super cool to watch. So congrats again. Thank you. It was a pleasure. It was an honor. Be a friend, tell a friend, and subscribe. Earned by Creator IQ. Creator IQ is your all-in-one solution to grow, manage, scale, and measure your influencer marketing program. Ready to unlock the power of the creator economy? Get started with a demo today at creatoriq.com.